This week we're going to turn to a topic which is um, not commonly discussed in some, most areas of cognitive science. And it's a topic that is by and large ignored by the various forms of scientific psychology that you might encounter. We're talking about movement, the stuff that bodies do. Uh, movement comes in a wide variety of forms. It's, of course, ubiquitous in the animal kingdom. Um, <clears throat> There's an awful lot to see and to understand in movement, but one of the first things that we have to do is realize that when we're studying movement, it's not quite the same thing as studying behavior. Now let's try and figure out why that is. Movement occurs all over us, all around us. So here's some movement. You can see a bunch of dots moving. This particular display was prepared to illustrate an illusion, but we're not interested in the illusion. We're interested in the fact that that's just a load of movement. It doesn't really admit of any interpretation. That's movement, as it were, raw. But some patterns of movement speak to us instead of purpose. Here you're also just seeing dots moving. There's no persons involved. And yet it's pretty much impossible to see this without interpreting it in some way. And when you interpret the movement of those dots, you're seeing behavior. And there's no behavior here, there's only dots. The interpretation is yours. Behavior is what happens when we interpret movements in terms of goals and purposes, which means it's not an objective category, which means that the same set of movements could be interpreted by two people in two completely different ways. And the manner in which they interpret that will depend on what they impart, what they want to see, or what they're convinced they should see. So looking at exactly the same movements of someone, one person may see them committing a crime, another person may see them exercising their right to freedom, for example. The interpretation of movement is not the same thing as movement. So we're interpreting the movement of bodies, and when we're doing so, we need to avoid overlaying our psychological categories onto what we're seeing. It will not do to, we cannot understand movement well, if we take many psychological accounts too seriously. Psychological accounts are guesses, hypotheses, it's the makeup we put on our own face, and it doesn't survive a lot of scrutiny when it comes to movement. So one thing that psychological theories are fond of talking about is how the brain controls the body. Now, there's a puppet dancing on some strings, and uh, this is the sort of picture that underlies such notions of control, as if the body were the controlled and the brain the controller. The same relationship as obtains between a puppeteer and their puppet. This is fanciful and will not do. We'll see that the notion of control is much more complicated than that, but the statements like the brain controls the body are born out of this kind of projective nonsense. Brains are, need to be understood in a much more realistic manner if we're ever going to understand movement. <clears throat> Our language here is uh, <clears throat> often not very realistic. We attribute all kinds of things to brains without knowing for a second how this organ of the body could possibly produce the magic that's claimed of it. The verbs we use for brains are really important. And when we're being realists, we won't use such language. We won't say, my brain decided, or my brain figured stuff out, or my brain saw, or my brain felt. If we say the brain decides, the brain figures things out, we're speaking not only metaphorically, we're speaking fancifully. Brains are absolutely not people, they are organs. Whereas those verbs, which are the proper subject matter of psychology, for example, deciding, seeing, feeling, those are verbs appropriate to persons and not to brains. We do have this tendency to attribute our self-image to this one organ. But there again, there's a lot of mystery in the universe, isn't there? If we 
recall how we approached the topic of brains, we started by looking at the simplest of animals. And we saw that when nervous systems enter the evolutionary record, they do so as distributed nerve nets in animals that are a lot like our contemporary jellyfish. And we saw that what these nerve nets do is they cause the body to pulse. They introduce animate locomotion, if you like. So that the nervous system is closely associated with getting around movement, locomotion, in a very from the very, very start. And we can still see this today. Here's an interesting animal of a similar complexity to a jellyfish. It's a sea squirt. And a sea squirt has a, a life cycle that has two phases with a metamorphosis in between. As the philosopher Daniel Dennett describes it, the juvenile sea squirt wanders through the sea searching for a suitable hunk, rock or hunk of coral to cling to and make its home for life. For this task, it has a rudimentary nervous system. When it finds its spot and takes root, it doesn't need its brain anymore, so it eats it. As he said, it's rather like getting tenure. Now, Dan Dennis is a good storyteller, um, is a good philosopher, but he's being a little fanciful here. More accurately, the sea squirt undergoes a metamorphosis. It doesn't eat its brain. Um, but what's clear is that the second half of the life cycle of this sea squirt doesn't require a nervous system, and it's in its own interests not to have a nervous system. Nervous systems consume more energy than any other tissue type, and so having a nervous system is going to take up a significant part of your energy budget. So here again we can see that the nervous system is vitally connected with movement and the organization of the body in movement, which is perhaps a better way to look at it than brains controlling bodies. And so in order to find a way around here, a lot of what we have to look at are the details of how movement happens. And if we concentrate in the first instance on getting around in the world, a very general kind of category, we find all kinds of different ways of solving this in nature. We see the pulsing of the jellyfish, we see the multiple legs of the insects, the wings of the bats and the birds, the use to which gibbons can put their arms. We find all kinds of crazy ways of getting around. One question you might ask yourself is, well, Clearly, there's purpose in getting around. This is a very good sort of kind of thing for an animal to do, and evolution tends to come up with good solutions. Uh, why, why do we not see animals with wheels? Did that question ever occur to you before? <coughs> if evolution is so good at this, how come we don't all have wheels? Wheels are really great for getting around. Now, it's true that as we survey most of the animals, we don't find wheels. We do find something wheel-like, very wheel-like, in uh, the smallest of creatures, the single cell of the E. coli bacterium. E. coli bacterium has a cell body and it has a lot of whip-like tails called flagellae, and they spin around to propel the cell forward. And in spinning, they're attached to a thing very much like a wheel. So nature found the wheel, but it didn't make use of it. How come? Well, the answer is that the wheel doesn't scale up. A wheel is not just a rotating disc, it's a rotating disc around an axle. That's what a wheel is. And if you're rotating around an axle, you can't have any cables or connections or ties between the wheel and the axle. Biological tissue, above a certain scale, needs its plumbing. It needs its arteries and veins and lymph. Uh, it needs to supply nutrients and take waste products away so that the wheel at a very small scale works because the processes of chemical diffusion can do that. But at a larger scale, where you would need some plumbing, it's just logically inconsistent. So that's the answer to where the wheel is. Nonetheless, evolution found tons of ways of getting around.